King Sunday, and so many times we will hear things like, this is about the reign of Christ, and we will hear, this is about the kingdom of God, and we will hear about, this is about the kingdom of heaven, and we will hear about judgment. I, I, I want to say this, how many of you have ever stood before a judge or been in a court with a judge present? How many of you have ever been in court with a judge? Okay, that's just about everybody. Well, for those of you that haven't, I've been in two, I guess I would call it extremes of, of court cases. One, my first experience in court was uh, when I was 13 years old. And some of you are saying, no, wait a minute. <laughs> um, in the summer, I can't remember the year, but it was one of those 60s years, let's just say that. In the summer, I had a friend named Walter Hogan. I, I hope Walter is on YouTube and can listen to this because... I've never got to preach about Walter very much. Walter was my best bud in the uh, seventh and eighth grades and, and in the ninth grade at Leroy Martin Junior High School in Raleigh, North Carolina. Those of us that went to Leroy Martin included Mike Sloan, who was a later head basketball coach at Appalachian State. He was the son of Norm Sloan, some of you remember that name, who was the head coach at that time at NC State. And Mike and I were friends, and the, it, the, the person that connected us was Walter Hogan. I, I don't actually remember what church Walter went to, but I know he went. And because he was straight as an arrow. I mean, he was just, he's the kind of kid you'd say, well, this is not going to get kind of like our granddaughter Ellie. I'll brag on her. We sort of think that, that we have two granddaughters right now. We think one of them will be... Uh, a, she maybe a preacher, a priest one day, and the other one, we just don't know what's going to happen to her. But anyway, we were kind of that way. There was there was Mike and me, and I was on the I was kind of in the middle. Mike was a lot of trouble, I guess, being a coach's son and making the money that his dad made. Maybe he was spoiled a little bit. But anyway, Walter was straight, and Walter would say things like, "We can't do that. We shouldn't do that." Uh, we were at school one day, and we were going through the lunch line. And the lady with collecting the lunch money and tickets had to step back into the kitchen for a minute. And Mike said to me, just go on through. It, 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 it'll be okay. It, they, they, they make plenty of money here. They don't need your 35 cents. And Walter looked at us and said, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> the voice of Ma Walter Hogan, we used to say. Anyway, we would eat lunch together. So one Friday night, Mike Sloan had this great idea that the country club pool there down the street from Carter Stadium there in Raleigh, I don't remember the name of the country club, but it was a nice country club with a nice big pool, that the pool, he knew a way to get in the fence at night after it was locked, and we could go swimming in the pool. And more importantly, we could go swimming without our clothes on. Anybody ever done that? Don't confess that right here. <laughs> we did. Joy is wonderful. I'm telling you. You know, I know why babies have such a good time. They're just swimming around and having a great time. And our, 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 our grandson Matthew kind of likes to be naked occasionally. He's seven, eight months old. But anyway, so we're swimming around. And about that time, the blue lights come on and, and the fence gets encircled by several police cars. You would have thought there were other crimes more important than what we were doing at that moment <laughs> in Raleigh. We went to court. I mean, literally, we went to the city court, and they, the judge said to us this. He said, well, you boys have never been in trouble before. That they, I don't know how they knew that, but that's what they said. And we went to the city court. Here's what the judge said. A little bitty fellow, I'll never forget it. He looked over his glasses. That's why I wear mine this way, because he was really kind. And he said, 
I tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to call your mamas and your daddies. This was before cell phones now. This is when you had the phone on the desk, and it looked, you know, like the bell telephone symbol still does, and you had a phone on the wall, the kitchen wall, that was brand new, by the way, and it was yellow or green. Remember that? They were yellow or green. And so my dad was working in the food service for ARA, Aramark, at NC State, and my mom was working in the soybean lab at North Carolina State. And I laughed about that. So they were gone, and you know, I decided that I would stay home sick from school that day. It was warm weather toward the end of the year, and so I did. I convinced my mom I was sick. I did a better job than Ferris Bueller did that day. I was good. <laughs> So, I kept sitting by the phone, and I sat by the phone, and I sat by the phone. Do you know judgment can come in a lot of different ways? Did y'all know that? The judge could have said, I'm going to send you to reform school, or worse yet, I have this image. That spring sometime, our class had visited the state penitentiary at Raleigh, and as a shock troop, they had carried us into the gas chamber thing there and showed us that. And so I'm thinking it's the gas chamber for me, perhaps. You think a lot of things at 13 when the judge says, go home, we're going to call you. But you know what the worst judgment of all was? It was waiting for the phone to ring. You know, it rang, and I answered. I said, this is Harry McDougall. <laughs> so I not only got in trouble with the law, I learned to lie. I, might, I was pretending my, my, I was impersonating my father. And the ju you could hear that it was not the judge. It was whoever was saying, we're just letting you know that your son and two other boys uh, were caught skinny dipping at the, the such and such country club last night in Raleigh. Just letting you know so you can take care of any kind of punishment you think is appropriate. I said, thank you. He'll be a stern punishment when he gets home. Do you know, I thought for 20 years that they didn't know that sometime in a family vacation somewhere, baby and Dolphin Island, Daddy said, you didn't think you got away with that. <laughs> so here comes the judge in Matthew 25 saying, if you're a sheep, you're in. If you're a goat, you're out. And here's the amazing thing about this story. That was my first experience. With my, my second experience with the judge was praying in the, in the judge of Judge Morgan who had it in the back of his little store in McCool. Do you remember that, George? He had, the, he had the justice of the peace in the back of the store. And one night he called me at 8 o'clock and he said, I've got somebody that's been caught spotlight again doing things at night that you shouldn't do on the Natchez Trace with a spotlight. Did any of y'all ever been caught doing that? I hope not. You still don't have a truck or a gun if you did. It happened to be a Methodist preacher, a friend of mine. <laughs> and when he walked in the court, into the back of the store around the sacks of grain and rice and, and cans of tomato sauce, he walked around that and he stood there and Judge Morgan says, well, I'm going to remand you to the federal court in Aberdeen because it's a federal case because you're on the Natchez Trace. I didn't know that, but he did. And, I, you know, I think he paid a $1,000 fine and they took his truck and his gun and they told him if he ever was spotlighting deer on the Natchez Trace again, they would take more than that away from him. That was bad. Then, then I had an experience in court, really sad. A couple in the church at Aldersgate called me. Their niece had been murdered two years earlier, and they were getting ready to give past judgment on her husband who had hired two men to kill her. Some of you may remember that case. And I remember sitting in the tension in that court. And I remember looking not so much at her family, at, at they were sitting next to me, but looking at the person accused and wondering what he was thinking that judgment was getting ready to come down. We don't talk much about heaven and hell, and that's not what we're going to talk about today because that's really not what Jesus is getting at. You see, there are three simple judgments in this passage and in my limited experience at being a judge and I by the way I'm not a very good judge of goats I think I've shared with you my one 
my first real experience of deer hunting, I killed a goat by accident, but we won't even go with that. <laughs> Kelly Black, George, and some of those hunting, up the hunting club where, where Miss Harden's son lived had the house. I, oh, that was a mess, wasn't it? Hmm. Here's three things I see in this passage. And we're gonna to come to the table in just a few moments. And when we do, we're gonna think of ourselves as sheep or goats. And I, I want you to not think of yourself that way. I want you to think this way. First of all, that the difference in this passage between sheep and goats is in what they see or don't see. I mean, let me be careful in how I describe that. It's not what they do or don't do. It's what they see or what they don't see. There's a word for it in, in, in modern psychological language. It's called mindfulness, or it's called in counseling, awareness. What are you aware of? What are you mindful of? What do you take care of? And more specifically, it's who they see when they see. Um, I'm not sure who it was that said we need to see people with the eyes of Jesus. Some preacher said it. It's a nice statement, but I will say this. It may be that we need to change it to this. We need to see Jesus in whoever we see. That's pretty judgmental, isn't it? It's really saying what Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees and to his own disciples at times. How many times did you hear in the gospel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these words, those who have eyes to see, let them what? Let them see. So it, can I say this? Inherently, in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that we all have through the church, that we have that relationship with Christ, if we have that, if we have that relationship with Christ, can I tell you something? We have it innately in us to see the way Jesus sees. Now, somebody's going to say, wait a minute, I'm not Jesus. But that's what the passage is saying. If you, It says in the parable, and it is a parable, blah, blah, that the shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. Not the goat herd. Not the hireling. Not anybody else. It's the, it's the one who knows the sheep. Jesus has already said that in, in the Gospel of John. The sheep know the shepherd, and the shepherd know the sheep, and they know my voice. They understand what I'm saying. They see the things I see. They hear what I'm trying to explain and get across to them about this kingdom business. Basic conversation between Jesus and those who do not follow him. Closed ears, closed eyes, closed minds, closed hearts. Now, you're saying, are you saying we're that way? That we at Starkville Presbyterian Church, we're Christians. We are baptized. We're going to take communion. We're going to share the Lord's Supper. Some of us are elders. A lot of us are elders. Some of us have been in church all our lives. All of us can point to our baptism or to a moment in which we confess Christ, in which we said, I want to follow him. But you see, I think, it, I think he's saying that there's always the possibility. I want to be careful here. There's always the possibility. My Methodist... Stuff's going to creep in here with my Reformed theology a little bit. And it's going to say this. There's always the possibility, John Wesley said, that we could actually go back and revert back and start acting like people who weren't following Jesus at all. And you want some evidence of that? Just go look at the Gospels and look at the disciples and look at Peter, at literally at the trial of Jesus. I don't know him. Look at who showed up for his crucifixion. Look at him when they were in the upper room on Easter evening, even after they'd been told and had seen the empty grave cause, they still were in disbelief and were not quite sure. They still couldn't see and were not willing to hear what Jesus was saying to them. So that's the first, the first judgment is that, is that, it's not what we do or say or act like or confess through our mouths in church. It's what we see. And more specifically, it's how we see people like Jesus. And the second judgment, and a difference between sheep and goats, is what they feel. I know that's a bad word for Presbyterians. Yeah, this week, 
some of you, I, I even think, uh, I'm trying to think, some, somebody in church maybe responded to that. Uh, I, somebody, one of the preachers on, on the Presbyterian Facebook page, I was having a glance at that the other day during Thanksgiving, and somebody had said, when you, when you preach your sermon, do you, do, you, do you have it written a week ahead of time or a month ahead of time, or do you have it written down and you've got it down? And I said, so I, and I said do you ever change it on Saturday night? And some said, well, I've even changed it on Sunday morning at 6 a.m. And you know me, I've got a comment. I said, I sometimes change it in the middle of the sermon altogether. <laughs> and I said, and sometimes I change it during the anthem because someone, and sometimes I'm sitting in the middle of the sermon and it changed. It just did right then, by the way. <laughs> Here's what, and somebody said, what do you call that? And I said, the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Boom. One good Presbyterian friend named Jerry Long, I love Jerry. Jerry said, he said, you're going to have to convince some of these Presbyterians of that. But anyway, the difference between the sheep and goats, secondly, and the judgment that comes upon us is not because necessarily what we see and don't see. It also happens because of what we do. <coughs> you see, Jesus tells the parable and he said, there were some of you that, that saw people and saw the need and you said, oh, in fact, you saw them as I see them and you did something about it. You showed compassion. In the scripture, whenever the word in the Greek is used, in, in most cases, most cases, don't hold me to this, my friend Reverend Davis out in California would kind of correct me on this, but I think in most cases where it talks about Jesus feeling something, it's the same Greek word and it implies that he felt it in his gut. We have trouble with a Jesus being gut feeling, gut reacting. But it says the difference between sheep and goats is the compassion that they feel from what they see. The good Samaritan saw what both the scribe and the Pharisees saw. He saw a guy in the ditch, but was moved with compassion. The father of the prodigal son saw, just like the brother did, but what did he do? He ran to him. And over and over and over again, Jesus describes in the Gospels people who follow him who see something the way he sees it and yet are moved to do something about it. And that's the motivation of churches. That's where we get our vision. That's where we get our idea. When we see somebody hurting, instead of saying, well, they're different from me, or, you know, I'm not sure they live on a different side of town, and maybe they're even a different color, and maybe they're even thinking about the Bible, this Bible passage differently. But you see, Jesus said, do you see something, and you see it, and that's one thing to see it, but does it move you? Does it move you to compassion? And then there's the third judgment. And this is where it gets really shaky. And I don't want anybody to feel my judgment here. Please, this is not my judgment because I could do my own. Here, here's, here's where I really fall down. It's, it's, I, I'm really pretty good at seeing people, I think I am, as Jesus sees them most of the time. There is that famous case, though, where Rebecca, our daughter, I don't know how old she was, and she was in school, and we had moved to Columbus, and uh, what grade would Rebecca have been in when we moved to Columbus? Did she start in school yet? First grade, that's right. She started over, she started to, oh, kindergarten at the, at the Catholic Church. That's right, we did. We don't want to talk about Sister Kate, though, now. We don't want to get into the chalk on the sidewalk and all that stuff. But I remember her going to school, and one day she had evidently heard at the little Catholic school there in, in Columbus and from her kindergarten teacher and from the nun, she had heard about the Good Samaritan story. And so we're going along, and there's this guy, and, and by the way, if you ever were in Columbus in the 80s, you saw him. It was in the old days, right, just about where one of the banks was before you got to First Methodist on the boulevard there going toward downtown in Columbus. There was a bench there in front of one of the banks, and on this bench was an elderly black man, and he laid there, and he had newspapers pulled over him, and this was before we thought, well, we really need a homeless shelter in Columbus. And so we're driving by, and we're literally stopped at the light, and the windows rolled down in springtime, and, and I don't remember what Rebecca said, but she grunted or something, and she pointed and I said, what's the matter? She said, your daddy, the good Samaritan. I said, what? She said, the good Samaritan. I said, oh, no, no, honey, he's not the good Samaritan. She said, no, no, you, good Samaritan. 
She's always had my number, by the way. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness. But I'm not consistent as I want to be. And sometimes the children can see things. But here's what it is. The, the last area of judgment is the judgment between sheep and goats is how consistently and completely their compassion translates into action. So let me say this. They're seeing, they're feeling, and they're doing. Consistently. Jim Fowler, Emory, said this. He said, the people who are, live out the gospel are not necessarily the ones who are perfect, but the ones who are the most consistent. And persistent. We just talked about the talents. You know, the servant with one of the two sons. One who said he would go and the other one who said we've done that all. By the way, this all fits into Matthew. We've talked about it all the last two months. The one, you know, said I'll go to the vineyard and work. The other one said I won't. Which one is the one that did it? It's the one that did it. Not the one who said he would do it. When you are moved in worship or in a retreat or in prayer time or heaven forbid, through this sermon, what do you do? If, is this passage about believing in God so that you go to heaven when you die? I don't want to rule that out, but I don't think that's the main purpose of it. I really don't. This passage in general and passages throughout the Matthew in particular don't seem to be interested in heaven and hell. No, what they really seem to be interested in is this. Not, am I going to heaven? Will I be saved? Am I a sheep? Am I a goat? Matthew suggests, according to John Stott, that you have missed the point. And anyway, if you are listening to this sermon right now, chances are that you're less concerned about the end of the world than you are about the end of the month. What you're seeking is probably not pie in the sky, but pie in here now. So maybe the question rightly asked is not what happens at the end of time, because you see, that's where people preach this. Oh, at the end of time, there's sheep and goats, and you're going to get cast into utter darkness, and you're going to go to heaven, and here's what it is, and here's what it really comes down to. But more like, what am I supposed to be doing right now? Today. You see, this conflict over who is Lord gets acted out in every sort of way in our lives. If you don't think it gets acted out, just look at the hiring of a new football coach and you see what's going on with that. Look, I don't even want to get into that. Y'all going to get me in trouble yet before I leave here. You see, Jesus is asking, what do you see? Do you see what I see? How does it make you feel? Does it make you feel like I feel? <clears throat> What'd you do? Did you sort of do? Sort of? Notice I let you off the hook. Sort of do what I do. This is not about salvation. Martin Luther said that. John Calvin, John Wett, all the great saints who deformed religious movements of great strength and power in their age, none of them have ever said this is about saying you, if you do certain things you're saved, it makes you a sheep. There's certain qualifications for sheep and go to it. No, it's simply the people who begin to see and think and feel and act consistently as much as they can like Jesus. I confess my openly, my sinfulness, and I confess openly that I'm not sheep-like a lot of time. I'm more goat than sheep. And I suspect maybe you could say that. And you see, this is not about getting more goat-like or more sheep-like or getting, you know, making sure we bone up and start. And let's go find somebody to look at so we can figure out what we're supposed to feel toward them and then see what we're supposed to do. No, it's, it's literally, think about this. If you started today with just the people you run into today, starting right here with church, and say, do I see them the way Jesus sees them? In the 12-step programs that I've been a part of in the past. There's something called a 10-4. A good friend of mine, some of you met Lindy, 
back in the days of the Born Lindy, had lots of issues and lots of problems, and he was, he was as ADD as any human adult I've ever met. But Lindy said something to me one time. He said, you know, I've come across this idea, and he said, I think Jesus would okay it. He said, what if we, if looked at the, whenever we viewed somebody, we didn't look at them with all of the history we thought we knew about them. What if we took all the history we thought we knew about them? What if we took about everything we thought we knew about their situation, and we just threw it aside, and we said, I'm just gonna look at them right now for where they are right in this moment today what's their need what's their situation how can I as a follower of Jesus Christ help them pray for them meet that need I think that's what it is Dr. Martin Luther King said one time in a great sermon I, I encourage you it's on YouTube you can watch it he had gotten the Nobel Peace Prize, and there was a lot of controversy about that. If you were Southern and you lived in the South and were white, you remember some of that. He said this. He said, uh, if Christ is king, what does that mean? If Christ is ruler over our lives, then my Nobel Peace Prize is less important than my trying to feed the hungry. If Christ is king, then my invitations to the White House are less important than than who I visited in prison. If Christ is Lord and King, then my being Time Magazine Man of the Year is less important than how I try to love extravagantly, dangerously with all my being. How are things going to end? How are, what's going to happen when we die? I, I don't know. Totally, and neither do you. No. But we know that Jesus waits at the end of that story and, and what he's waiting for is to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You saw what I saw. You felt what I felt. You did what I wanted you to do. Sheep or goat, in or out, heaven or hell. That's how we like to frame it. I like to frame it this way. What did you see? How did it make you feel? What did you do? Let's pray. Lord, we're going to come to your table in just a few moments. Your table. And at your table, we're going to all be equal. Receiving grace. Lord, help us to, uh, to know that, to hear that in the invitation. And the choir is going to sing in just a moment, and then we're going to, then we're going to, uh, take a moment and talk about what it means to be one people at one table, one Lord. Help us to do that in Christ's name.
in the front of your hymnal and also in the pew, there is a sheet that looks like this. If you'll take that and follow along this morning, we're going to use an abbreviated form of the Eucharist this morning. But let me share this invitation with you that this is a joyful feast of the people of God. If you join me in the great thanksgiving, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Would you lift up your hearts? We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Would you be in an attitude of prayer? O oh Lord, when the earth was formless and void, you called creation into being. And you made the earth, and you created us. And you placed us in a perfect place, and we failed you. And yet, Lord, in failing us, you continued your grace through the prophets and the patriarchs. You continued to offer us what it was to be your people, all that was necessary. So therefore, we praise you today, and you join our voices with the choirs of angels and with those prophets and apostles martyrs and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name holy 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 lord god of power and might heaven and earth are full of your glory hosanna in the highest blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest would you bow in prayer lord we find ourselves today with the scripture that tells us that we need to see people as you see them. And we need, to hear, we need to feel what you felt with compassion and love. And we need to do. Lord, we're reminding ourselves that in the fullness of time you came and, and, and from a, as a virgin to a virgin and were born and lived and taught and healed, did miracles and fed the hungry and opened the eyes of the blind. And then in the perfect time, you went to the cross and died. And you died so that we would have forgiveness of our sins. And you died so that you could rise again, knowing that you conquered death. And holy God, you loved us so much that we give thanks to you. And great is the mystery of that. That Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And now, Lord, as we come to your table, we give you thanks that on the night before you died, you took bread and after giving thanks, broke it, gave it to, his, to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the meal, you took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance. And so, Lord, in remembrance of these, your great acts in Jesus Christ, we come now to your table and we offer this prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll be invited. I'm going to invite the choir to come first, and they'll receive. And you'll take a, a bit of the bread, and you'll take it's on the table, and you'll receive it there. And you'll take the cup, and you'll partake of it there. And then you'll place the cup here. And then if you have your offering for uh, two cents of ale or cents of bitter, you may place it in the little basket on the on the pedestal there just to the left of the uh, <coughs> food stuff that we brought today so we'll invite the choir to come and then following that we'll invite you to come in the normal way we come to come to this side and to come down and thereby receive the body and blood of Christ <laughs> Body and 
blood of Christ given for you. Thank you. Bill, this is the body and blood of Christ given for you. Jane, his body and his blood given for you. Vic, his body and blood broken and shed for you. And Gail, this is his body and blood given for you. Amy, his body and blood given for you. God of abundance with this bread of life and the cup of salvation that we've received, you've united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now as we sing this closing hymn, send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may see the people you see as you see them and feel for them as you feel for them and do as you do. That your redeeming love to the world may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Number 269. Lead all no king eternal. We're just going to do the one verse. 269. Will you stand with me as we sing and remain standing for the for benediction?